Hello everyone, this is Fabrice Garrier and I'm here for a new podcast recording and this time I want to talk about Friedrich Nietzsche and some of the major ideas that I believe that has impacted my life and my thinking and I, I really believe like if we're able to understand his ideas in a way that makes sense and a way that reconfigures your world and you're able to apply those ideas, I really think that you can take hold of your life and shape the future in ways that um, is unknown and unseen and extremely powerful. Um, why does he matter? Uh, I think what Nietzsche is, is you could say that I could literally record 30 episodes, 40 episodes, 50 episodes around Nietzsche itself. Like overall, I can make the argument that he is one of the greatest minds that has ever lived on the planet. And he's influenced some of the greatest people that have led social and political movements, literary movements, even companies um, from like existentialism to psychoanalytic. He's he's at the center of the 20th centuries. And I think that it should not be discarded. He's really often misunderstood, misinterpreted and often discarded. He's often painted as a nihilist. And I would argue that Nietzsche is not a nihilist. He's a mystic. Um, and oftentimes when you hear a lot of like the sort of social tensions around his ideas really started with his sister. And his sister was an anti-Semite. And what she did after he passed away, she took a lot of his works and his writing and republished it under a quadrant of very like fascist, anti-Semite like text. So I think that's why a lot of people have been really hesitant to explore his ideas or really discard him as someone that is white wing and 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 really not conducive to the construction of society. But I will beg to differ. I think Nietzsche was someone that was full of meaning, full of passion, full of humanity. And I feel like a lot of his ideas has shaped so much, so much. I cannot even begin to imagine. So what I hope to do with this recording is really condense some of his big, big ideas and the way that I understand it and the way that like that I've engaged those ideas across my life as a black immigrant from Haiti, um, having these revolutionary like sort of values from a nation that was born out of slavery and people imagining out of their own sheer will to change their condition. So I think he resonated with me so much and I want to do something like I wanted to record this conversation to talk about the future and talk about Nietzsche and how his ideas can really be applied to our thinking about the future and, and why these ideas are so important. Um, if you don't know some of the general background, uh, Nietzsche was like at the young age of 19, he was the chair of the Department of Philology at the University of Basel, the youngest ever. And philology is really the study of dead languages. Um, and just to give you an idea, so young Nietzsche and midlife Nietzsche and and uh, adult Nietzsche, his ideas have evolved in so many different ways. Um, and I would claim that he was um, uh, a genius. Um, just to frame the conversation, I love this quote that he says, and I'll, I think that will really frame his way of thinking is he says, and those who were seen dancing were thought to be insane by those who could not hear the music. I think a lot of Nietzsche's ideas that he really valued creativity, he valued the will, he valued sort of this self-directed self-expression and really going deep into the, the, the very primal wells of our mind and harnessing those forces and in evolving ourselves for good, the good of humanity. And I feel like if if someone really understood that quote, I feel like for me, what it says is that you, you always, 
I don't know, across your life when you're meeting people and you sort of like, you're like, wow, there's something about this person or there's something about the energy of this person. Why is this person always happy? Why is this person always moving with life? Why is what makes this person like vibrate in such a way or this sort of the charisma of that individual? I feel like that's what Nietzsche is talking about. It's like you build this sort of inner life that is so robust that that you have tuned in into yourself and this your heart and your passion and your highest excitement and you're sort of like on a different wavelength than a lot of the people uh, i've met so many people across my lifetime that have that energy and i've yearned to really bring that out more in my life and i feel like a lot of it is really on this understanding of my values there is this understanding of clear clarity of like I can say in the in words of like Fabrice Guerrier is here on this planet to do, which is to raise consciousness. That is sort of my personal mission. And I think that mission drives me. And whenever I feel like I've sort of stirred away from my path, I'm always reminded about my why. Um, and I think he has another quote. He says, those who have who have an understanding of the why can really engage or experience any how or any any problems that they experience so i feel like a lot of his thinking has that sense and it resonates so much deeply with me so i'm so excited to start to really dive in with some of his ideas and how it relates to the future so i'm going to summarize some of the big ideas that i'll be exploring over the next hour um the first one is really the the connection between eternal occurrence and amor fati, which is a Latin word for the love of fate. Um, and really talks about embracing everything that has happened to you and will happen to you, no matter what it is, the good, the bad, the ugly. He almost, I feel he almost transcends good and bad because he sees all experience as beautiful and that it's there to forge something out of us. So I will be exploring a little bit of that idea I think this idea for sure for me resonates so much in my time in LA because I feel like a lot of the work of creativity is really surmounting the will to power. So I can't wait to dig through that and what that means um, for you and for the future and why that's important. Um, I, I'm going to explore his novel. He was a novelist as well. Aside from him being a, an essayist, a philosopher, a novelist, a playwright, a poet, um, a thinker. Um, he wrote, yeah, he wrote novels. Um, and one of his novels that I really hold very dearly is called Thus Spoke Zarathustra. So I'll kind of explore a little bit some of the big things that I got out of this. Um, another thing that he talks about is the idea of creating oneself and, and this sort of meaning making and how do you do it viscerally and how do you do it right? Another one he's really famous for is this idea of nihilism. Um, and, and his famous words, I think a lot of religious people have always pinned him as like this sort of antagonist of the church and his God is dead. I think that is is such a powerful word that he's, he's uh, claimed that has rippled across history. So like he's known for a lot of that, but I think there's so much more to that. Um, another one is the Ubermensch. Uh, which literally translates as this as a Superman, um, and I can't wait to dive into that as well. And something that I've really like I've been exploring is this idea of the Apollonian and Dionysian uh, mythologies. Um, and is when he was young and nineteen, he wrote this book I'm holding right now. It's called the 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 Birth of Tragedy. It's a pretty intense book. Um, I've read it. And I've underlined it. And there's a pretty, I think that's some of his hardest. His first book is always the hardest to understand where he was coming from. But I want to explore a little bit what that means for us as a society and the role of mythology in all of this. Um, and then I'll go sort of the final thoughts in terms of how it relates to the future. What can you do now? And why we need to create the future with ourselves and no one is going to save us. No one, there's no one coming. So I think that's what I love about Nietzsche is that it really, he really explores this sort of like taking control 
because we always feel like we have to depend on other people to give us permission to breathe, to exist, to do. And this sort of radical attachment to community, radical attachment to self. And I know those are, those are certain ideas that I'm going to explore. And I know that there is going to be a lot of different recordings and podcasts in the future. And what I want to do is I want to be able to like to, to really dig deep into these ideas and show you these ideas. So I think Nietzsche it's himself has a particular way of thinking. Um, and I think his belief system, again, I, I've said this in a lot of the episodes is that I think that becoming human is this absorb, absorbing of many definitions. And the more definitions that we have inside of us, the more we're able to deal with reality, the more we're able to be anti-dogmatic and really flourish with our imagination and create the future. So I think the particular brand of philosophy that Nietzsche does is very critical. And I would almost say it's very dangerous as well. Because if the inner work hasn't been done and you're not having, you don't have an ecosystem of ideas inside of you that are rooted eternally in so many different aspects, I think this idea can be very cannibalizing and can in itself be very dangerous to society. So I think that's why a lot of his ideas has been shunned or he's been pushed away a lot of the time. So let's, let's just, let's dive right in. Um, Eternal occurrence in Amor Fati. So he describes eternal occurrence as imagine that you are waking up like your entire life from start to finish. You are repeating that life over and over and over and over. He's literally saying like every tiny little action, everyone that you meet, every thought process, every pain, every cries, every laughters. Every path that you've ever taken, whether it's in college or high school or your first love or your first book you're reading, he says literally every micro or grand action or your grand arc in your life, you're going to experience it a million times and you already have experienced it. And he almost frames it as that there's a sort of eternal occurring of these events in your life. Um, I think what that really brings for me internally when I first thought of that idea and and really thought about it really deeply of what it meant for me is like there's a some almost a release because we take life so seriously and like if if me Fabrice or you have everything that you've done or experienced the ups and downs you've experienced it for eternity and it's bound to happen again in another lifetime. I think that conceptual model really releases you. And there's a level of freedom of ecstasy that sort of rises from this perception of, of experiencing things over and over again. I think this mental exercise, I think has been liberatory for me because it starts to redefine the future because it gives you more freedom. It's, it almost gives you that there are no mistakes. Um, and I think that's where he, he's, that's been at the root of his sort of philosophy of amor fati, which is the love of fate. Um, because he's, he really feels that if we are able to embrace fully everything that has ever happened to us, no matter the good and the bad, the trauma and the suffering, it's it's that that's what's going to create the future that's how we're going to create ourselves that's how we are going to be more happy be more free and be more engaged with society because we have nothing to lose i think so it's it's that's why you start to see how dangerous some of these ideas are because it's like you you start to realize that like because i know i'm going to experience everything that i've ever experienced and has experienced it's almost as if I have nothing to lose. So why not go after your dream? Why not be spontaneous? Why not uh, do something that you would not do before? Why not dream as much as you possibly can? So I always try to take that from the action. I think there's a zest of life that Nietzsche speaks and knowing that every single action that we've ever done returns to the same path. And it's, it, it's called to move into a moment that transcends time and space. 
And I love what he says. He says, live as if the day was here. It's almost as if it's like, you. this is the day. Every day and every moment, there is a becoming of something that already was. Uh, I think that's so liberatory. Uh, and one thing he says, he says, woe says, fade, go, but all joys want eternity, wants deep, deep eternity. And I've always said, like, personally, a lot of my thinking has always been that, how do I dance with eternity? I feel like if I can have one foot in eternity and one foot in the physical, I think that gives me a lot of the conceptual, like, patterns of how I can, like, exist better. So I feel like eternal occurrence and amor fati, I think if you're able to really master this idea in your mind and and really root it, it starts like time and space just starts to dissolve in a way. You're more present. And you, we know and science shows that this idea of being in the moment is not a sort of new age babble process. Like an on a business term, on a leadership term, like in a leader in an organization, when you're more present, you're bringing the entire company, you're bringing the entire organization, you're bringing your entire team to that presence. And that's, and, and being present, that's where creativity, that's where consciousness, that's where innovation lies. So I think we really have to pay attention to our actions and the emotions we have attached to these actions because they themselves are eternally occurring. I'll leave that to that. Um, I love the second, um, idea and this is the will to power um so for first for you to understand the will to power i think it it is pretty much self-explanatory it's like a will to power um but he studied a lot of arthur schopenhauer which was a german philosopher and one of the biggest ideas i think for you that i can say is that arthur schopenhauer believed that the human being is not sort of a monolithic being. He tried to really deconstruct some of the enlightenment ideas around what consciousness is and the human body. And he felt that there lived like thousands and thousands of wills. And he defined these wills as like sort of biological, animalistic, cultural, societal, historical. And think of these wills as like forces that are just like driving irrationally. They are at best irrational. And they each seek to do irrational things and just kind of repeat their things over and over and over again. Like for example, hunger. He says hunger is a will. And that's a will for us that has existed and has been born from this sort of biological evolution of being a primate and that we have to survive. So there's a will to live that exists in us and it's at best irrational because we have to eat food to survive. Um, it, there's not necessarily a purpose to it. It's like we eat food, we live. And it's just sort of program. And he says there's a lot of different wills that are brewing in us. And and I feel like one of the court Schopenhauer says, he says, life is a constant process of dying. And I feel like what that tells you when you start to look at this idea of the thousands will it really shows you that being human is almost an algamation of, of these wills that are continually evolving and growing and dying. And I think you sort of have to overcome those things. So I think when, when you start to understand where Schopenhauer is coming from, you start to see where and how Nietzsche is able to take this to the next stage. And I think it's really being able to be your own master and being able to have power over yourself. Um, and I think that's the hardest thing because I feel like for us as human beings, as sort of divine creatures, we have a will in us. And this will, I would say, I would argue it's come from directly from the soul. And I feel if we're able to harness that will, I think we can create unimaginable things in our lives. Um, this is a quote by Nietzsche. He says, the secret for harvesting from existence the greatest fruitfulness and the greatest enjoyment is to live dangerously. Build your cities on the slopes of Vishishis. Send your ships onto uncharted seas. Live at war with your peers and yourself. Soon the age will be past when you will be content to live hidden in forests 
like shy deer. Um, wow. Like, I almost want to repeat it. I'm going to repeat it again. He says, the secret for harvesting from existence, the greatest fruitfulness and the greatest enjoyment is to live dangerously. Build your cities on the slope of a vicious, send your ships into uncharted seas, live at war with your peers and yourself. Soon the age will be past when you will be content to live hidden in forests like shy deer. Like what I love about this is that it really sets the tone of like what, how, what's at stake in being human. Because oftentimes we sort of shy away from the challenge. We shy away from really wrestling with ideas that can challenge our own. And I feel like this idea of the will to power is it's claiming this force inside of us so we can really be at war with the world so we can conquer ourselves. So he uses a lot of the language of violence and war because he sees that this world's in decay. Um, he, he, he predicted so much of what is happening today in our society that I spoke on in a previous episode around how nihilism is so flagrant and present and causing so much pain and suffering today. Um, he says only great pain is the ultimate liberator of the spirit. I doubt that such pain makes us better, but I know it makes us more profound. And I, and I think how that connects to the will to power is really that we have to claim inside of us parts that are unknown and parts that are very deep and hidden and unknown because we fear so much to go deep, dig deeper, be and at a more profound sense of existence. I think that's what the will to power is, is really claiming all aspects of yourself, the unknown, the shadows, the darkness, the, the, the demons, and really fighting those and, and being willing to be in change by this, in this sort of perpetual struggle with the world. Nietzsche says, the worst enemy you meet will always be yourself. You lie in wait for yourself in caverns and forests, lonely one. You're going the way to yourself and your way goes past yourself and past your seven devils. You will be a heretic to yourself, a witch, a soothsayer, a fool, a doubter, an unholy one and villain. You must be ready to burn yourself in your own flame. How could you become new if you had not first become ashes? wow i i i just the magnitude of how he's able to sort of word and frame these things we have to become ash ashes we have to go through a path of self-destruction we have to be able to understand that the greatest enemy that exists is partly due to the world but at the end of the day it is ourself and if we're feeling and experiencing something and it is our fault, which is, I think it's really tough to even say, because I think in today's world, we talk about creating space. We talk about um, the, 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 pepper, the perpetrators. We talked about the, the oppressors and the victim, which are very real and radical and true based on how colonialism has shaped our planet. But Nietzsche goes even further and says that that is the norm of the world. Like the way in the the aspects that you're engaging today and how you're feeling is pretty much your fault. That's what he's saying. And I know that sounds really problematic on many levels because who am I to say to someone who's been raped or someone that has gone to war and their countries have fallen into deep, deep, deep suffering or even if we know clearly that a certain government is destabilizing a certain region and we know the clear pepper perpetrator and there is deep injustice. But like Nietzsche is saying that the pain that you are experiencing is what is going to liberate you fully. And I think that for me, when I first heard that, I felt like I didn't first, I didn't really understand what that meant, but I fe felt like I began to understood the will to power more profoundly when I studied trauma healing. 
and I trained at uh, my master's in, in this program called STAR, Strategies for Trauma Awareness and Resilience. And a lot of that program looks at trauma from so many different dimensions, such as bio biology, sociology, uh, philosophy, history, or even like emotional intelligence. It looks at it from so many different lenses. And the goal is really to provide a level of understanding on, on the physiology and the experience of trauma and where it sits in the body. And I think for me, when I begin to sort of like merge some of the Nietzschean ways of thinking and, and relevance to the, my own trauma, it's almost as if it's like this battle was happening inside of me and I as an individual needed to conquer it and that no one would be able to help me. Like I had to make the first step. I had to raise my fingers. I had to look up at the world inside of me. And I think this individualism that Nietzsche really talks about, the will to power, the sheer will to bring something into existence is something that is very uncomfortable for a lot of people. Um, it is still uncomfortable for me, but I do find comfort and knowing that I have power to take control and change my own course of my life, no matter what privilege or non-privilege that I have, no, no matter what the consequences is, there is a way to live and thrive. And I think that it is problematic on many levels, on extreme dimensional <laughs> problems of 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 socioeconomic and political and historical things but i love what he talks about because he sort of is essentializes a lot of this problem in the inner life of people um and really i think it's i'm barely scratching the surface on this idea of the will to power and how does someone claim their will and forge I think I always say, and I had mentioned this in the little book, uh, Breaking Free from Mass Religious Consciousness. Well, I do, I'll do an, an episode on that book that I wrote. And this idea that it's almost as if is Zeus, uh, this, this sort of mythological creature, Zeus is like forging out of lightning, uh, his, from his hammer, he's forging lightning. And I think that's literally what it is. It's like, the incredible force and power of the soul, of the mind, of our emotions are so primal that we are destroyed by these things. But we have to jump in. We have to. What are you waiting? Um, the next one is, is this novel. And I remember when the first I read it and I think it sort of blew me away. Um, and it's called Dust Spoke Zaratustra. And he pretty much follows sort of the hero's journey in this process. It's about this person that is sort of like kind of sick of society and leaves out in a mountain. And he goes in a mountain, sits in a mountain, and pretty much just kind of reflects on life and sits there for many years. And he reached this sort of this enlightenment vision. And Zarathustra starts to realize that as an individual he needs to go back and like liberate everyone so he kind of taps in this sort of mythological um pattern of like the plato's allegory of the cave you can see it in jesus you can see it in muhammad you can see it in buddha it's like we seek enlightenment in ourselves so we can be that light and we go back in society and risking like risking death pretty much because a lot of people are gonna disagree with ideas that are radical, are gonna disagree with you um, when you have this sort of profound sense of awareness. But he says, I think a lot of Das Posa really pushes us to embrace the dissonance that exists by living your truth and speaking your mind and your ideas. Um, I think to give you just, a, just context, he's like, he's really exploring a lot of his ideas um of like how do we look at society that often follows the just popular culture like he really talks about like this herd mentality which i'll explain a little bit more in the uber man 
which is, I think he's pretty tied to the dust folk side. So, but he really speaks on the herd mentality. He pretty much says society's herd. Like when groups of people come together and they organize around an idea and they believe so strongly in that idea, he is against those things. And I think it's like, there's a paradox to that idea because he says that dogma is pretty much a group of people that are coming together and embracing an idea. And he says dogma formed because a lot of people really just embraces conformity and they don't really want to challenge like the status quo. Um, so a lot of this book like explores um, how does the character Zarathustra reaches this sort of state of, of enlightenment, but also what are the tensions of him trying to point out the mistakes and the failures and the shortcomings of the society today or his society around him, despite people not necessarily hearing him, not listening him. I think I found a lot of resonance in this because like as an immigrant, like being from Haiti, I think a lot of people don't really understand Haitian culture. A lot of people don't understand what it means to be a black Haitian. And in terms of having and the responsibility that I have uh, being from a country that is the first independent black country and this idea of the imagination, the radical imagination. And I feel like for me, um, this book resonated a lot because I had to really embrace some of these ideas so I could really integrate them in my life. And I think as an entrepreneur, as someone that is growing a company, the production house syllable, I, I feel like a lot of people don't really understand world building. They sort of discarded as um, something that is like just fun and cool, but they might not see the profound uh, power of creating a, a cosmos, a cosmology, not only for the creator involved in the process, but also the industry of what's happening around the need for artists today and creating meaning. So I felt like a lot of those folks at Artistra, I felt like I was at Artistra. It's like, I have this vision and I'm kind of crazy around this vision. No one, else, no one else understands this vision, but it's sort of this journey of like bringing people together and empowering those people to imagine their own worlds, their own universes in such a way that they're able to lead their own passions in a way they can inspire other people. So one thing he says, Nietzsche says, and once you're awake, you shall remain awake eternally. Um, and I think what that means is almost as if it's like you, you can never go back once you've like tied does those pieces together and find a profound sense of awe, a profound sense of understanding. And he almost gives you permission, gives us permission to like really embrace those aha moments um, and really engage this, this awareness that by self-destruction, by engaging paradoxes, by really absorbing these definitions that we engage, we can grow unto ourselves. He says, what is wanted are, are blindness and intoxication in an internal song over the waves in which reason has drowned. Um, yeah, pretty much that's a direct critique of modern society of like how blindness and intoxication is, is almost the norm. And that is, it's a wave that has submerged us and drowned us profoundly. And I think you will see this a lot in my writing, the my, the um, breaking free from Asperger's consciousness. I think that's the, sort of the canonical vision is that society is the antagonist and that we've become heard. And we are just kind of following the norm or comfort. And we're not really able to imagine new meanings, new structures any longer. We're so attached to history. We're so attached to any meaning structures that have come previously. And he calls all of these meaning structures intoxication, blindness. Um, so Dust Books Archer, so I would recommend it. It's pretty, the language is not like friendly in terms of like lay reading. It was definitely tough to read it, but I feel like what I got out of it was a profound sense. And I had to read it like a couple of times before 
I got the idea and also I had to watch some YouTube videos. I had to have I had to be in discussion with other people. I had to also read commentaries online. To, and I think I'm still getting new ideas from it. So I would recommend it. Um, I think a big thing also that, that I've learned from Nietzsche and also that I talk a lot about on the podcast is this idea of creating oneself. Because once you're once you're like expressing this sort of self-destruction, you have to create new meaning. You have to be on the hunt for new meaning and always, and you cannot settle for um, for less. I, I feel like for me, that's what I've learned the most. This is what he says. He says, the most short-sighted and pernicious way of thinking wants to make the great sources of energy, those wild torrents of the soul that often stream forth so dangerously and over overwhelmingly dry up altogether instead of taking their power into service and economizing it. So he's pretty much saying like, you're, you're, you have one life and, and your bad habits and your good habits, they should all be used in this sort of, ex your expression of your becoming. Uh, you cannot put anything that you, inside of you stored away in a bottle, in a corner, and not use it fully for the change that you can be or do in your community, or at best, the creativity and your aspiration that you want in your life. Um, I think that he says that the raging rivers can be harnessed for its energy, so too the uncivilized layers of the psyche, if channeled and hindered properly, can vitalize life. So he says like inside our mind, there are rivers raw primal rivers that manifest these different corners and aspects of ourselves, whether it is trauma, whether it is fear, whether it, whether it is joy, whether it is doubt, whether it is an idea that someone has put in your mind, all of those can be used as if it's the Nile River to flood like in the crops and your potential. So I think the idea of creating oneself is really central to Nietzsche's idea um, because without creating oneself there's nothing there's nothing else I think he puts I think that's his one of his greatest ideas is that to live is to create oneself if you're not doing that every day if you're not doing that every moment if you're not doing that every second of of your existence then you're saying you have not lived and I think that starts to put you see, this is what I'm saying. Like these ideas are so like intense and tough because a lot of people talk about rest. A lot of people talk about uh, transition. A lot of people talk about um, like care or radical, uh, or radical peace. A lot of people talk about different ideas. That's how I'm saying. Like this is just one lens, one belief system that I feel like can be a tool. But again, you cannot take this for the main thing. I feel like I'm always going to say like to create the future, you have to have more multiplicity of definitions, a multiplicity of belief system inside of you that can play against each other, that can give rise to who you are. So I think this idea of creating oneself every second for me as an artist is pretty, it's pretty impactful. And I use it all the time because I, I love learning and I love growing. And, and I feel like if I'm not doing that, every time I feel something is missing or lacking, I have to take a step back and really start to see that I have not learned. Like I have not grown. Like when is the last time that you learned something? When's the last time that you've created something as opposed to just consuming brainlessly and, and intoxicating and blinding yourself with the eternal song of our society today. Um, so I feel like that is a tough thing to even think about. Um, and I think this is a perfect transition. Um, so a lot of people say that Nietzsche predicted the rise of Nazi movement. Um, and the way that he, he, he predicted this, he felt like as a society, um, a lot of the power in terms of the morality and the values of our society was framed by the church. 
the Catholic Church provided a certain mythology, a certain story, and a certain narrative that allowed people to really find comfort, but also like live out their lives in terms of in terms of giving meaning around life, around death, around community, around family, around pain, around suffering. It literally that the mythology of Catholicism or the church, the Vatican, at the time he, he lived or even before he lived, felt like there was such a power and influence the Roman Catholic Church had on the global world, um, whether it's good or bad, because we can talk about colonialism, we can talk about like the, the, the crusade and the conquest, and we can also talk about the good that it has done as well. But he felt like these mythologies provided a sort of way of thinking for people. But when he felt that the Enlightenment era, when science started to rise, where people didn't, like people started, it's science in the Enlightenment era began a sort of movement of materialism where people started to believe less and less in sort of this higher power, this divine force. And he framed it as that God is dead and that we have killed God and washed it with our blood. And I think in, in saying that, he felt that now that society has evolved to a point where knowledge, this sort of fetishization of knowledge and knowing in this Western way is it has pushed us where we no longer have a, a grand mythology that is guiding our soul and our mind. And he felt that because we didn't have this mythology of the profound sense of meaning making, the state and the nation state or nationalism is almost this sort of um it's sort of this sort of disease that rose where people needed to believe in something and sort of replace those primal need for a mythology as meaning making human being creatures so and i talk about this in the other episode too around saving the future from nihilism is that like we currently live in a society where nihilism is the norm and that we don't really have a mythology, a grand mythology that sort of defines our existence. And I would claim, and that's, this is a new thought in my life right now, I would claim that one needs a grand overarching mythology. As, as much as the power of having multiple definitions and multiple belief systems, I would claim that one needs a grand mythology to survive. I will make that argument. And I think that's something that's very recent that I've realized in my time here in LA. Um, but I feel like people always claim that in Nietzsche announcing that God is dead, that he's a nihilist, but I would say he's not a nihilist. He's often misunderstood. What pretty much what he was saying is that he felt that because the church and this sort of higher form of values that the Catholic Church had provided and now it's gone and science is now the norm and now there's multiple truths. I feel like what he says is that we have to find new values. Um, we have to find a higher order of existence. And, and these values are not inherent anymore and they don't come by naturally. We are just sort of like humans with no values, no values at all. And I think that's why I love Nietzsche so much because he says the solution is creativity. He says unbounded and unfettered creativity is the way towards finding these new values. Um, and, and I feel like that's such a profound sense when you look around around the world when there isn't this sort of overarching human like mythology. It is so fragmented and people are just sort of born into the world and like, they don't believe in God. They don't believe in divinity. They don't believe in, in the earth. They don't believe in the planet or they might believe in different things. It's, so it's like, there's so much things to learn and unlearn and engage and, un, and not engage. It's just crazy. So I feel like for me and my personal philosophy in terms of the future is that, yes, you need to absorb all definitions, but it's that's a critical stage of like eradicating dogma in you. But once you've had this ecosystem that's thriving with paradox and meaning, you are now able to 
use those things in your art to discover this sort of higher force that's going to take you to become the Uberschman, which is transitions us in the next idea, which literally Uberschmensch literally translates as the Superman. And this is how the, the idea of Superman as um, a, a character was actually born. Um, it, it was born from the Uberschman, this sort of Nietzschean way of looking at someone that is super has super strength, super vision, super flight, and they're able to go out and use their powers to do good in humanity. So I think that's what Nietzsche really saw was literally Superman. But the creator of Superman actually created Superman uh, during the the rise of like the like Nazism and also during this the 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 harm against black people in America, the racism, the segregation of literally someone that came from another planet that didn't speak the language, didn't see anything, and they had to flee their home from war, came to the earth and had to really start all over and discovering their own power. So I feel like there is so much like there's so much power in understanding like how do you you yourself become a superman a superwoman or day damn like you need to be able to understand yourself and rise above the herd mentality um he says the herd mentality like sheep we follow passively what the world tells us the history the way of life he says an individual's insanity is where but in groups, parties, nations, and epoch, it is the rule. So he pretty much discards out any forms of systems. Organized system is defined by insanity, which uh, insanity, if you don't know, is repeating something over and over and over and over again. That is pretty much what insanity. So I think Nietzsche, in a sense, was anti-insanity. And I think in understanding why that relates to the future is that the reason why our society is so messed up right now is because we just keep repeating the same ideas that these dead people 200 years ago have told us are so great. And I think the paradox of Nietzsche, he is one of those dead people, but I think out of these dead people, he speaks so much in finding our own ideas and really pushing the boundaries of anything that starts to sort of saturate itself. Uh, he says, one must be a sea to receive a polluted river and not be defiled. Wow. One must be a sea to receive a polluted river and not be defiled. So I literally see this as translating as like this accumulation of definition, this accumulations of meaning, this accumulation of belief systems in us. That is, is sort of, we are literally destroying the ego in that process. We are literally moving our own self-destruction and in destroying our own sort of way of seeing the world because it's like being human, like we so attached to like, okay, this is who I am. I'm Fabrice, I'm this person, I'm that person, I'm this person. And we're like, okay, this is who I am for the last six, 10 years. And our identities don't even change. I think... That is the same thing that's happening on the macro level on the planet is that we are living in an outdated system. And that's what's causing the nihilism is that because things are so broken, we're not able to move outside of those processes. So to be an ocean is to absorb as many ideas as possible and seeing the ideas that are sort of perplex and complex and really being able to see the ecosystem of how they live. That's the only way. Because if you don't have those, like I always say, like to be human is like, and to be able to change yourself in a profound way that changes your community. Like you need to have at least like a thousand belief system in you, minimum. But I feel like most of humanity, which is okay, lives with two or three belief systems. Um, and I feel like for me, like I value like at least the people that I encounter who have those more belief systems, I see more humanity in those people. Um, he says, Nietzsche says, 
This is why I go into solitude, so as to not drink out of everybody's sitting, sittern. When I am among the many, I live as the many do, but I do not think as I really think. After a time, it always seems as though they want to banish me from myself and rob me of what I really think. Rob me of my soul, and I grow angry with everybody and fear everybody. And he said this in Daybreak, Thoughts on Prejudice and Morality. And I feel like this sort of claims this idea that, like, really going against this sort of herd mentality. Um, he was really against this herd mentality because he grew up um, as a child. His dad was a minister in the church. So like, I think that's where he sort of saw this dogma of, like, really, when people don't really profoundly understand the Bible, they don't understand like the messages of of Christ and the messages of that religion, they sort of look at it from a very tyrannical way where they realize that um like god like like okay, so this is a quote that I love it's by um Desmond Tutu, and they asked desmond to a journalist asked Desmond Tutu and said, like what can Christians or Catholics learn from other religions?" And Desmond Tutu said that God is not a Christian. And I love that. Um, and I feel like Nietzsche saw that. He saw that this sort of divinity in us is beyond the sort of canon of ideas that like seeks to extinguish in us our power. Um, and he says, how can someone who can't save himself save others? Supposing I have the key to your chains, why should your lock and my lock be the same? And I don't really know what that means, but I feel like I've repeated this quote so much throughout my life because it gives us the sense that everyone else has their own journey. Um, there's no right journey in terms of what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to do it, but you have to take the path to do it. Um, I think the next one is what I talked about and I'm going to pull the book up. This is um, the tragedy of the birth of tragedy. So this this book, The Birth of Tragedy, was Nietzsche's first book. And he talked about the Apollonian and Dionysian uh, themes that existed during the Greeks. And for a lot of people that don't know, the Apollo, the Apollo was associated with the bowed music and divination he was the the epitome of youth and beauty, source of life and healing, the patron of the arts. And then and then Dionysian was like the the goddess of like of wine and partying and dance of fruitfulness and vegetation, especially known as the god of wine and ecstasy. Um so I think that what I got out of this book and i'm still trying to figure out what it means even after like looking through it i feel like he he talks about like the role of these gods and mythologies played in us evoked a sense of power and a sense of purpose and gave us gave at least the greeks a meaning or a version of the world i always feel like mythology is always trying to pull these different forces in us um and it teaches us sort of a really new way of of understanding ourselves because it's like all of these are sort of the expression of like the collective human consciousness that is expressed externally through these stories and in turn in having this dialectical relationship with these this mythology we are changed by it so i feel like a lot of it he talks about like how like these primordial forces should not be ignored and it lives in us and is often contained and I think he he hints at creativity, which I'll give in my final thoughts. I feel like a lot of this, the pull and talk between the Polonian and Dionysian, I think it's this, he shows that in society today, we don't have those mythologies anymore. Um, and, he, and he looked at specifically the Greeks and how those things were so like pivotal to their society. And they sort of gave them permission to exist in this certain way and show up in a certain way. And you can only begin to imagine once you don't have those sort of mythologies around, what are you left with? We're left with nothing. We're left with void. We're left by being pulled and twisted and tugged in ways that we don't know. 
So I feel like I'm going to make a future episode around mythology, exploring specifically Joseph Campbell. But I think the Apollonian and Dionysian struggle and the and the birth of strategy really speaks to how can we really embrace like these stories that can invoke in us these frameworks of being um, and what happens when we don't have those things. Again, this is a sort of like absorption of meaning and definitions in paradox, sort of destroying our sense of the world so we can figure out what we're not to become who we are. Um, he says, every culture that has lost myth has lost by the same token, it's natural, healthy creativity. Only a horizon winged about with myths can unify a culture. The forces of imagination and the Polonian dream are saved only by myth from indiscriminate rambling. The images of myth must be demonic guardians, ubiquitous but unnoticed, presiding over the growth of the child's mind and interpreting to the nat mature man his life and struggle. That's so beautiful. I think this represents a lot of my personal struggle in my life because I feel like my dream, especially with Syllable as a company, as a production house, is really to create the next mythologies of the future through these fictional worlds. And I feel like this mythology is or what is going to unify the planet. Like the shared vision, the shared imagination, these things are what is going to pull us together. But again, the challenge is that we have, we run the risk of being heard like, which I think Nietzsche warns us just against because we are creating the same problem that created the first place. So that's why I feel like for me, when I'm exploring the Nietzschean way, it's this sort of visceral ability to create. And now we have to create incessantly, unbashedly. We have to create every day and every moment. And the greatest creation is creating ourselves, creating our mind, creating our hearts, creating our body. I think creativity, mythology, and imagination, according to Nietzsche, are the recipe for changing and transforming our current society. Because these things are not rooted in dogma. They're rooted in sort of a primordial force that is chaotic and inherently alive that changes and transforms and moves and grows. Because the paradox is like when we affect policy and when we affect change systemically, that change is already outdated. That change has already passed its time. It's already a software that no longer meets the demands of the soul and the mind of humans that are always in continually growing. So I think a lot of the power in Nietzsche in the future, he really starts this movement of post-structuralism, which forgives and forgets this sort of this systems, the physical system, this materialism that has so much blinded us. Um, I think Nietzsche would say that individual pursuits of creative expression and, and that force, that will, that's the highest good that we can do as human beings. That's how that we're going to destroy the iconoclast. That's how we're going to be able to recreate ourselves unbashedly. That's how we're going to be able to heal not only ourselves, but in the process, the world. Nietzsche says, in order to be able to create, we must give ourselves greater freedom that has been given to us before. At the same time, liberation from morality and relief through festivals, premonitions of the future, celebrate the future, not the past, compose the myths of the future, live in hope, blissful moments, and then cover up the curtains again and turn our thoughts to fix, close goals. I love that. I really love that. He speaks directly on the future. And he ties our individual action to the future. Because we don't know who and what and where our creation and the impact of our creation will have. And he says that we have the power to do that. And oftentimes, when we live in the herd 
and we live as the many do, do, we do not see the power we have in stepping out because we are blinded. He says that because we are blinded, because we are heard like, we are not able to give ourselves the permission to reach this greater freedom. So I think the paradox of the Nietzschean way is that it sort of breaks hold of society. I do personally think that if everyone was Nietzschean in the world right now, we would have a lot of wars, a lot of pain, and a lot more suffering. And I'll tell you why. Why? Because those ideas are not to be taken for granted because you have to do the work. You have to do the inner work. You have to be able to nest Nietzschean philosophies with a thriving ecosystem of other belief system. Because if that's the only system that you have where you believe you're God, like you're separating yourself from reality. And you're, you are the problem that Nietzsche even and is talking about. So I think he himself realizes that his ideas have, are dangerous and that he needs to be, like one needs to be able to continually question oneself and not live with the status quo of our own being because this is an endless process. It's a meteor that is traveling across the, the sky that is being destroyed by its own flame. Um, Nietzsche says, for nothing is self-sufficient, neither in us, ourselves, nor in things. And if our soul has trembled with happiness and sounded like her heart string just once, all eternity was needed to produce this one event. And in the single moment of affirmation, all eternity was called good, redeemed, justified, and affirmed. And I quote this in the book as well, in the Breaking Free from Mass Produced Consciousness. And I think what he talks about here is that, like, there's this sense of ecstasy and giving ourselves permission to feel this radical sense of freedom that gives us permission to do more good. Because society is not going to give you permission to do that. Because oftentimes we just wait around and we wait for people. We wait for that big break. We wait for this sort of uh, report cord. We wait for that funding. We wait for that job. We wait for so much things to be in line for us to do things. We wait for that feeling. He says that, once you have reached this sort of point of eternity of, of trembling of this sort of self-destruction of yourself, this good is something that once you've understand it, it, it builds upon itself and you can reach that thing. Um, I love what he says here. He says, and we should consider everyday loss in which we have not danced at least once. And we should call every truth false, which has not accompanied by at least one laughter. I really love that. Like this sort of idea that there is a sort of joy. There is a sort of paradox of this cosmic laughter. Because I think laughing is such a complex emotion that brings so much parts of ourselves. So it's I think what he says here is like, how do we find spaces in us that allow us to express things that often seems don't seem like so normal and so simple. Um, and I feel like through these things and this becoming, I think it's the power. It, we have a responsibility. We have a moral about obligation, I personally believe. Once you start to really understand the ideas of Nietzsche, whether it's from eternal occurrence or there's from the will to power, the idea of, of why we need to fight this nihilism in us. And we need to fight this nihilism in society that is so conducive to structures that are inherently flawed. You start to see that, that you have to drive the ship of your life. Like no one else will. And I, and, and, and I think that is an idea that is very problematic because I'm, I'm a collaborative human being. I'm a community-based thinker, and I, I do value relationship and systems and connection. And I think that is another belief system that I fundamentally like feel is critical to our world. But I also feel like 
it comes a point in time where you have to engage the Nietzschean ideas and this Nietzschean world that of nihilism that has sort of taken hold of our planet and where we we have sort of what I see is like the blind leading the blind. You have leaders around the world that are reading from a manual that is outdated, whether it's from statecraft, whether it's from the economy. Everyone's just looking back to our history. Everyone's looking back to, to ideas that have been tested and tried. And it's just like not working. So I think to end this, I feel like that a lot for me, what Nietzsche represents is really the cusp of creativity and this sort of moral obligation to be creative and explore radically new imaginations. Um, because in our becoming through the will to power and becoming the superhuman, the Ubersmensch, I think in that self-expression, we have the power to change the world. It is that simple. It's like we change ourselves and we change the world. And I think that's what he really meant. And, that, and that's such a dangerous idea because a lot of current systems just would rather that every single person believes the same idea. But he fundamentally, I would say, his ideas are democratic because the more ideas that are internally in you, it's a pathways towards that self-destruction of that monolithic force that seeks to hold your mind in a certain positionary state. And once you reach this duplicity, this complexity, then you can start to see the pattern that rises from that complexity in you. Then you can let the soul rise from this ice age that is plaguing mankind. So I hope you enjoyed this. Please, please, please follow me below on this channel and, and share this because we'll be talking a lot more about some of these big ideas and big thinkers that I think are so critical to the future of humanity. And I hope that you've enjoyed. Please leave comments and, and yeah, and support me on Patreon. I think without the Patreon supporters, I would not be able to do this. So like, if you feel compelled that to, for me to put more ideas and more, more like, exploring these processes and how they changed my life. I think Patreon is the best way to do that because you'll be able to see the inside of like sort of the creative process around constructing these narratives. Um, and also a lot of these things in my personal writing and what's happening in other areas of my life. So please go to Patreon, become a member of my community. And I'm excited that you've tuned in. Until next time, thank you so much.